But now we are back with a panel on Green New Deal and practical implementation of solutions. So we have some experts in their fields who are going to talk to us about various ways that we can actually move towards solutions, including Jeffrey Gracer, who's a principal at Side Paget and Reisel, an env environmental law firm, who's going to speak specifically about our building stock and New York City's Green New Deal legislation. Jonathan Rose, who is president and founder of Jonathan Rose Companies, who will also be talking about the building sector. Chad Frischman, vice president and research director of Project Drawdown, talking about the really comprehensive look that the Project Drawdown initiative takes to bringing emissions down across all sectors of society. And then Leah Stokes, who is assistant professor of political science and environmental studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara, who will be discussing various policy solutions. Let's kick it off with Jeffrey. Do you want to say a few words about your work and kind of the message that you want to get across to people in terms of what we need to do to get sustainability solutions going forward? Sure, John. Hi, everyone. I'm Jeff Gracer, and I'm, I'm a lawyer in private practice. I'm in the private sector, and I'm a climate activist. And there are a lot of people in the private sector that are becoming increasingly concerned about the denial of science and leaving this world a mess for our children and future generations. Um, in New York City, there is now um, a lead, leading legislation called the Climate Mobilization Act, which addresses carbon emissions from buildings in New York City, which surprisingly, at least to me, the first time I heard the statistic, represents 70% of all greenhouse gas emissions in New York City. Uh, we also have a, a very broad state law that also addresses, among other things, emissions from buildings. So what we need to do in New York City, and we have the legal tools to do it, is to build it back better, to use this as an opportunity to reframe how buildings use energy, and, and that's energy for heating as well as electricity. Uh, the good news is that there are proven solutions, and I just want to uh, cite one example. White and Case, which is a, a major law firm in New York City, just completed a move a few years ago to a new office, nine floors in a big office building. And instead of just designing their, their new office space to code, they analyzed what they could do to actually reduce their, emit, their use of energy and their consequent emissions by as much as 30%. And what they found was that for an initial capital investment of about $400,000, they could make that back in energy savings in one year, and then year on year for 20 years, save another $400,000 a year. Well, so anyone who tells you that it's bad for business to save energy and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, that's one example where that's absolutely not the case. That's a great decision for, for White and Case. It's a 1,000% rate of return and it results in a thousand metric tons less greenhouse gases every year for 20 years. Dozens of law firms and many corporations in New York City are doing this kind of work in, in connection with their leases, uh, which will be helpful under, to implement the Climate Mobilization Act. We've been working with the mayor's office and the, the New York State Energy Res Research and Development Authority and a nonprofit that I chair called the New York City Climate Action Alliance. I want to end my comments with some questions. What would happen if every business in New York City that's a tenant in an office building did what White and Case did? And what would happen if every business in every city in the United States did that? And what would happen if every business in every city around the world did that? Thank you. And uh, next up, uh, a few comments from Jonathan Rose. Hey, thank you so much for having me and congratulations on this huge effort to put this together. I want to talk about green building retrofits from another point of view, which is affordable housing. Our company is a national affordable housing developer and owner. 
we take everything through a program called the Enterprise Green Community Guideline, which is a affordable housing standard uh, that I was involved in creating 15 years ago, like LEED, but it's designed specifically for affordable housing. And it not only focuses on climate reduction and water reduction and energy reduction, but also um, using non-toxic materials and environmental health. Um, what's so interesting to me is that if we simply uh, caulked around our windows and doors and added insulation and, and uh, LED lights and a bunch of really simple technologies, um, low flow water, um, aerators, et cetera, we could reduce our climate impacts by about 20% in all buildings in the United States. And um, these are really simple proven technologies. Everything we do as a company has a five-year payback or better. That's a 20% return on investor. So number one, for investors, we're in a very economically volatile time. And to find a 20% return that is absolutely standard, you know, steadier than a bond and non-correlated with the rest of the economy that comes with the green energy retrofits is incredible. The second thing is there are literally millions of jobs that can be made because all those things, the caulks and glues and, and weather stripping and the windows and doors, the insulated windows and doors, we should be making locally. And reducing transportation costs and increasing manufacturing in the United States. So in essence, with a green energy retrofit program for all housing, we can be saving money, reducing climate impacts, creating lots of local jobs. And these are jobs that require from skills that are trainable, when COVID is over, it, I think that a third of the retail jobs in America might go away. I don't know. I hope not, but we're gonna, we'll see. But we tend to be relative to the rest of the world way over retail. I care deeply about the people who have those jobs, and we can create the jobs for many of them to come back to with green energy uh, retrofits. Uh, the, the last thing I'm going to say is that I think everything we need to think of as a pathway to planetary health. We need to think about all the local things you've heard about today, the citizen science and everything, as cells in the body of the earth that add up to the planet, the overall planetary health. And I think this is a big one. Yeah, and I think the COVID crisis really makes the urgency of a Green New Deal even that more palpable. And Leah, you wanna say a few words? Sure. Um, well, I think that we have multiple crises going on right now, of course, the COVID crisis, but also the climate crisis. I am in California, and I live in a community that is, uh, you know, has been dramatically affected by drought, Santa Barbara, um, but really all of the Western United States has been going through a mega drought. We know that that is linked directly to climate change. And we've also been facing fires here year after year, and that too is linked to climate change. So the impacts are already here, and we need our federal government to be stepping up. And I think that in 2021, if we have Democrats in control of the Senate and the White House, we have a really amazing opportunity to really take on the climate crisis in a way that we haven't yet. Um, the thing that I think is the most important to do is to get a federal clean electricity standard on the books. That is something that advocates have been trying to get passed for decades, but have never managed to because fossil fuel companies and electric utilities have been opposing their efforts. And I know that because I just finished a book which talks all about how these companies have been resisting climate policy. And we really need to be fighting back. Um, and I think that a federal clean electricity standard can set the rules for, for places all across this country to start making progress. And that also means, as Jeffrey and Jonathan were talking about, that we can electrify other sectors of our economy, namely the transportation sector and the building sector. And if we do that, if we clean up our electricity system and electrify transportation and buildings, we actually get 70% of the problem solved. It's not a small amount. It's a really big amount. So I think that we have a huge opportunity in 2021 to rebuild our economy in a just way, in a clean way, in a healthy way. And I'm really hopeful that we will be able to do that. 